Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on which part of the world you're watching from, you're joining us from. And today we're having the second installment of the Living as a Poet conversations brought to you by um, the French Institute of South Africa um, and Total South Africa um, in collaboration with Impepo Press. Um, and hosted by the ever so gracious, hugely awesome Poetry Africa through the UKZN Center for Creative Arts. Um, and today, so earlier on this week on Monday, we had a I mean, we announced the participants, the chosen participants for the anthology um, Yesterdays and Imagining Histories and, and Imagining Realities. Um, and as part of that announcement and as part of that series, the French Institute thought it would be such a great idea to organize a series of conversations to help equip young poets. So yesterday we spoke about um, kind of balancing living as a poet, uh, making money, but also writing with integrity. And today we are talking to Uka Mawam, who's joining us all the way from um, Sri Lanka, Vangila Makwakwa is um, is a, a money wealth. I mean, a, a wealth um, healer. I think <laughs> she's um, oh, she God. she heals she heals ancestral. She helps women, um, well, people heal ancestral money trauma, uh, fall in love with their bank accounts, increase their income, and live their best lives. She's also um, the, the voice and the brains behind Property Magicians podcast. And um, um, so um, going... just one half of the brain, sorry. Meso is the other one half. half, one half of the brain <laughs> behind Property, um, Property Magicians podcast. And so um, what Vangula has done is she's been so incredibly gracious um, and she's created a wealthy resource package available to the young poets um, here in the in the webinar and also um, available for download from the Poetry Africa website. And this resource um, basically encourages poets to take um, their own learning and their own inner work into their own hands. It has everything from calendar apps for scheduling, booking apps, affordable websites, advice on building um, a mailing list and how to register a business in South Africa so um, so that we can cover as much as we can in this 30 minutes. Um, she's graciously put that pack together. Hello, Vangile, how are you? <laughs> I am fine, thank you, Vangi. Can I just say, I can't get over knowing another Vangile. <laughs> I know, right? It's quite exciting. Um, yeah. And for those at, uh, at home, and um, if, if you have any questions and you don't know how to, to ask, you feel free to say um, Vangi for me or, and Vangile for Vangile Makwakwa. Um, also feel free to, to say Vangile M or Vangile G, whichever one suits you. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, so, you know, I have a lot of, I, like I was thinking about this and I, I realized that I have a lot of anxiety around money. So let's start with, what ancestral money trauma means. What is that? Huh. So ancestral money trauma in a nutshell is just monetary, um, I guess, adverse monetary behaviors, memories, um, events, um, thoughts and beliefs that are just stored in ourselves and our nervous systems that our ancestors may have experienced even say three, four hundred millennia, two millennia ago, that somehow have been passed on from generation to generation and are now impacting how we relate with money. And often we tend to think of trauma as a big thing. Trauma is an event that 
we um, are unable to process. So it could be a, a two-year-old being shouted at for the first time because they wanted something and it cost money and the parents went all ham and it was the first time the child experienced this. And that somehow impacted their nervous system because they didn't have the resources to process it. And so it impacts how they then move forward asking for money. And every time they have to deal with money, let's assume your mom is pregnant or your great, great, great grandmother was pregnant. And every time they had to deal with money, this memory was triggered from the time they were two. Though those nervous system responses are now hardwired into your ancestors' DNA. And then the child being carried in the womb is being impacted by that and it just continues. And then they learning that that's how you behave with money. And then it's reinforced every time they're growing up and they're observing their parents, even though they don't get shouted out around money, they're observing their emotional response around money. And so it just gets passed down from generation to generation. So mm. if you then we have now take them, now imagine the amount of various events that our ancestors had. Multiply that by maybe, I don't know, <laughs> hundreds of generations and nothing mm. was getting healed. And I, then it just gets passed down and passed down. I mean, like you're blowing my mind. How, do, how can we, like what, how does this play out then? How do we see it? Like, okay. for example. So for... For us, the most common thing that I say to people is take just time today, go back, make a list. This is one of my favorite things that I like to do with people on my two and three day retreats, which is like, take time to just look at, craft your mom's history, your dad's history with money, if you know both of them. Most of the time for women, I say, look at your mom. Um, or look at your dad, whichever, and then look at your grandmother. Look at how they behaved with money. A good place to start is divided into four sections because we could go deeper, but this is a great place to start. How did they make money? How did they feel about making money? What were they charging? If they were earning a business, were they overcharging, undercharging, charging enough? How, how many hours were they working? Were they waking up at 4 a.m.? Were they working like 17 hours a day, 10 hours a day, two hours a day to make that money? How did they feel about receiving money? Then moving to savings. What, was, what were they like with savings? What were some of the things that they were doing, behaviors, what are some of the things they would say? I like, most people like to focus on the sayings. I'm like, oh, that's important, but I'm more interested in their actual behaviors, mm -hmm. right? Like look at how they would behave. Look at their debts. How did they behave with money? Like on payday, were they buying KFC? What was going on? What do they have shopping <laughs> accounts? Yeah, do they have KFC. credit cards? All that. And then now, be honest with yourself. Don't even bother looking at what you've written down about them. What are your current behaviors like? And then compare. Mm -hmm. And for most people, it blows their minds because they just like, wow, I am literally just playing the same scenario, even with my education, with my degree. I'm behaving, I may be earning 10 times what my mother earned, but come payday, my poison may not be KFC but it's clothing accounts and I'm still struggling to say, and actually for me to make 10 times the money that my parents made, I am still working the same amount of crazy hours and I'm still hustling and I'm also chasing down clients to pay me. I'm having the same kind of conversations around money. That is literally, that is what ancestral trauma looks like. It is not, it's not as subtle and as mm. emotional as people think it is. Obviously the root cause is the emotions, it's the memories, it's the traumas, but the symptoms and how they play out is like mm. real life tangible things in our bank accounts, in our credit cards, shopping stores, all that, like shopping accounts. That is it, that's how yeah. it plays out. So. Look at it and you'll start to understand your behavioral patterns and then take it a step further. Look at your siblings, look at your cousins, 
start looking at how they are with money. You may not know how much they earn, but look at their work patterns. Look at how much time they spend at work, how much time they're spending in their businesses. Look at how they talk about their debts. What do you know? And you will start to see that families tend to have the same patterns around money. There'll be that one, there'll be one or two who break away from that. And then also explore how does the family treat those people that break mm -hmm. away from that? What happens to them? And how does how do those family behaviors then sort of reel them back into similar patterns so that like everybody ends up having almost similar patterns in maybe not every area, but in some areas. Mm. That is how trauma so plays out. Like, okay. I mean, you're like, and also um, you run, you run a, a, a wealth money course. Um, so, yeah. I mean, that is something that, that is a resource that, uh, I mean, if people um, can get, get themselves together and do that for themselves, I think it's a fantastic yeah. course. I know friends who have been through it, um, who are going yeah. through it, um, who just share amazing stories. So like, yeah. I'm, I'm thinking as a poet and thinking, I don't earn a lot of money and I want to fall in love with my bank account, but like, as in, I don't know how to how to charge i don't know how i don't i don't even know where to begin what do you say to me um most poets have probably been told to charge what the market will pay but maybe that's part of the problem right is that everybody's uh we all assume we know what the market can pay and people are always shocked when i say actually the market what you think the market can pay is what you believe you can pay. Often we believe we won't pay X amount. So we think the market can't pay us X amount. So the first thing to do is to decide how much do you want to earn as a poet, right? Mm -hmm. And then to figure out how, how many clients or events or books or whatever you want to do, write-ups you want to do, what is it that you want to do to earn this money as a poet? And there's so many ways to earn money as a poet, right? You can do events, you can do events for the public, you can write a book, you can do corporate events, you can um, go on Patreon, I don't know, like you can coach others to be poets. I was sharing with one of our common friends who's also a Money Magic student about this concept of a book doula. It's like, oh my God, this is what I've been looking for all my life. Someone who will help me birth my books and that's how they make a living. So there are so many business models you can choose from, right? So choose two or three business models and then decide how much do you wanna make? How much do you wanna charge for those services? So here's the thing. One way that you can make money, there's two ways that most people make money in business. I don't know of any other way. It's like you service more people to increase your income or you increase your pricing and niche down and get very clear on what it is that you do, right? Mm -hmm. So then you, you find a way to also expand your business model in many different ways, right? So okay, maybe this is what I do, but maybe I can also provide workshops and maybe they don't have to be all offline. I can do online workshops. There are people who want to learn very specific things about mm. poetry and maybe I can offer that service. And then that's a new business model, right? Mm. So it's also about thinking creatively about our business models and then how do we then scale that business model? Mm to A, serve more people or increase our pricing so that we offer unique value to people. And then here's the other thing is that you need to have a strategy as to, okay, I can keep serving these people and keep going after money, but how do I then create a passive income stream, right? Which mm. nobody teaches poets how to do. It's always about the creativity, mm. but we need to live, right? So I literally work with different people and part of, and I love the Property Magicians podcast because part of what we talk about isn't just de, um, developing a passive income stream in terms of properties 
in the suburbs. It's like our mothers kind of knew how to do this. Our grandmothers knew how to do this. You can build back rooms at the location. You can buy land in the village. For example, it's like, I know land in my village is like 20, 15,000 rand, sometimes 20,000 rand. Some poets can make that on some events or a few events in a year and you just put it aside and then maybe you build back rooms so that there's something coming in every month, even if you're renting them out for 2,000, 3,000 rand a month per room over time and you just start with one, you're adding mm. a passive income stream all mm -hmm. the time. And so and so, um, like, I'm just, I'm just thinking about this, this conversation also in relation to the conversation I had with Malika yesterday. And obviously, there's, um, and the reason why we have this particular series is because it's, it's all linked, right? So, how do you, how do you develop yourself as a poet so that you can get to a level where you can, um, you can you can charge a certain amount, but also where you, you produce the quality of work that's going to allow you to be able to, to, to diversify, to niche, um, to create a niche market, to charge, to charge more. And so I just, um, I, I, I do want like young poets to be thinking about that at the back of their heads and also making sure that they're looking at the, the, the bigger picture that, you know, you don't just wake up and then decide, oh, I'm just gonna charge, Black as in you have to, it has to be in line with the quality of work that you are producing, with the, the amount of, of work you put into the work that you do. Um, and that's both like the personal work and the, the physical crafting work of, of creation. Um, but I, I, I do want to encourage people to ask questions. If, you, if you're watching on Facebook, on YouTube, um, on Twitter, just um, drop us a message, ask your questions, and we'll we'll get Ovangula to answer them. Um, if you're here in the in the webinar room, then please feel free to drop a chat or raise your hand, um, and we'll also acknowledge you. Like, um, can I quickly I, answer that? Because yeah, Vangile, okay. you're one of the few people that know that I'm a performance po poet, mm. and I started off as a performance poet, mm. right? Most people don't know that. And that actually yeah. my first company was around performance poetry and helping performance poets mm. uh, build their brands and uh, build themselves. So in answer to that, I think I can only share what my experience was in how I Please. built. I just wanted to be a slam poet, you know, and to perform on stage. I was never really focused on publishing. How I did that was I just did as many slams as was possible, starting off in Boston. Um, when I was in New York, I would go to places. When I lived in London, I was always at Camden doing things. When I was in South Africa, I was always performing. And it just adds to building things. And I would go to writers groups that uh, friends were hosting to talk about poetry. I read tons of poetry. Mm. I buy, like, I think every month I buy about like two poetry books on Kindle and I read them and I share mm. them with students. Um, I work on my craft as well, even though I'm no longer performing right now because I've been focused on wealthy money, I am still focused mm. on building that craft because I do want to go back to performing in a few mm. years, just not right now because that's not my main focus. And but I like I that you work on it. You, and I love that you're saying that because like, I mean, whether you're, whether you're in, um, in New York or whether you're in Johannesburg or um, in the Eastern Cape, find your poetry communities. Mm -hmm. And if you can't find them, build them so that yeah. you can have a group of people that you can share books with because books can be expensive mm. sometimes so that if I'm getting a book and you're getting a book we can rotate these books we can share these books um you know even and this can like you can post books you know like there are many yeah. ways but you and that's what I, I love about your resource pack because you also talk about how you have to do the inner work and that's that's in your hands like as in you yeah. are the only one who can who can be responsible for that um yeah. and also I I mean I I, I don't know how how I completely forgot to mention that we met um <laughs> like that you are a poet like as in of course you're a poet that's why we called you that's why it's important that you talk to to young poets so that they can see that it is yeah. like as in there there are many lives you can live 
as a yes. poet um, yes. outside just constantly being on the stage or yeah. um, making sure that um, you're, you're, you're just publishing. As in, there yeah. are many lives that you can live as a poet. Mm, and I think that's yes. really, really important. Yes. And honestly, when I'm honest, this is poetry is what, and the struggle to figure out how to build a business as a poet, for me, was what led me to this work. Because, I mean, I do have a finance background and I do have an MBA in finance. And I thought, oh, this will make it so much easier for me to make a living as a poet and as a writer. No problems because the skills are there. People have seen me perform. People know my writing. It's good. And then it came to actually charging for my services. Mm -hmm. And I would literally sit down. If people asked me to send them an invoice, I would take 24 hours before I could put together the invoice. I'd have a lump in my throat. My entire digestion completely went off kilter. Like the whole time that I was living uh, and doing Speak to Be Free work, my digestion went completely off kilter. I had a constant lump in my throat for about two years. Got to a point where I could no longer digest food. And I really, and that's what took me to do the work. Because I was like, there's nothing that medical help could do for me to kickstart my digestion again. Mm -hmm. And then I had this insane tailbone issue where I couldn't sit still. My tailbone was always sore and the doctors were talking about, oh, you may need to start removing your, or thinking of removing your tailbone. I was like, that's a part of my spinal cord, you know? And I just knew that the issue was money, but how did I talk? There was no one that I could say to them. I couldn't go to anyone and say, the issue is money because I know the monetary stuff. I know the practical stuff, you know? Mm. So how do I work with the other things that are tripping me up? How do I talk about the fact that it takes me 24 hours to send an invoice? What Listen. is the problem? You know, and then so I wouldn't follow up with payment. I never followed up with payment. So I never got paid. Listen, um, I, yeah, like I'm getting, I'm getting like, goosebumps because I'm actually like just very aware of the anxiety that money has caused me personally and I can imagine lots of people and so we have a question uh from Tony Stewart um could you talk to the deep-seated and unconscious belief that so many artists have around the fear of money the fear of making money and could you speak to the ways that our family stories and traumas impact our abilities to make money as artists Listen, I'm here for this question. I'm like, I'm Hi, sitting Tony. here for this. <laughs> so Tony is a money magic student. <laughs> so sure. it's really awesome. She's a wealthy money student. Yes. So and she's a wow, brilliant okay. poet. She's an amazing poet. Hey. Um, so how the ways that our like the deep-seated fears around making money. Wow, where do I even start? Right? So one of the biggest fears around making money is just that if I make more money, then like finish that sentence for yourself, but I'll just tell you the core fears. If I make more money and my family sees me making more money, especially for most poets and just people and people of African descent on the African continent, people of all colors on the African continent, mainly well, people of color, is my family will ask me for more money. People will think I have more money, right? So what does that mean? I lose my freedom. I now have to set up boundaries. And if I set up boundaries, my family may hate me, right? My mm -hmm. friends may no longer like me, right? So that is one of the core beliefs that holds us back from making more money, right? is that fear that now we will have more responsibility ladled on us. Or if I make more money, this is particularly for artists, I may lose my artist tribe. Who am I in this tribe of artists and in this tribe of poets? And this was a big one for me too, right? Who am I if I'm no longer talking about month end woes and talking about the worries of making money, right? And then mm -hmm. who am I if 
um, I don't have those worries, but people come to me and ask me for money. And then I'm like, I just have enough for myself and I can't help you. And now I have to center myself and look after myself so that I can keep being able to give of this mm. craft. Am I truly you know, an artist and an activist? This is this is actually so. I mean, that's this is so true because that that broke artist um, conversation and trope has been has been ringing so true for so long that it's it's like you know the that I will have sold out or I like as in I won't be as authentic um, <laughs> as if we're meant to be poor because we are artists. Yeah. Um, I also just want to note that I've been I've been very kindly called out for constantly talking about young poets, whereas um, this is something, this is an issue that a lot of poets are facing. Um, it's yeah. not just, so this is this is not helping just young poets. Um, yeah. And I mean, I, listen, I'm here like writing notes <laughs> for myself. And the fear, and here's one of my biggest issues. So this is, I don't know if this is true for everyone else, but I've spoken to another Money Magic student who's also a poet and in the poetry space. And we were talking about how I had to relearn how to write from a non-wounded space. Now that I am on this journey of healing and I don't have those deep woundings that money was a huge part of and my lack of boundaries and my family issues were a huge yeah. part of, how mm. do I continue to write? It was a challenge for me for, for years because it was like, what is my voice now when so much of my voice has been about my own personal struggles and coming from a place of deep anger and my own woundings? And now as I'm releasing my anger around my family, as I'm um, integrating the pain from my childhood, how in the heck do I now write? What do I write about? And is this still, is this new body of writing as valuable when it's not coming from a space of pain, right? So sometimes it's that we actively choose to keep our struggles alive because we believe that it makes us better writers, better poets. I remember like sitting down and thinking, I used to be a better writer when I was in angst. And then mm. I questioned that. I was like, this is nonsense. Like, do I have to keep myself in angst to write, you know? <laughs> Like, no, then I, then I remember telling myself, Vangile, if this was the only way for you to write, then mm -hmm. really you have deeper issues around creativity. I mean, you know, the you concept know, of creativity is flawed. What you're saying is so, is so, is so important because, because it, yeah, because it feeds, it feeds into your, 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 your money well-being, right? Like as in, if you yeah. have to be in angst in order to write, then you are actively seeking some kind, like as in the, the turmoil or the turbulence. And yeah. if you are actively seeking the turbulence or the drama or the trauma, then you, how do you, how do you, like, how do you create a healthy environment, a, a healthy financial environment? Because that doesn't serve the trauma and the, and the turmoil that you're trying to, to, to create so that you can write. My yeah. goodness, like as in- And um, also money will then destroy you, right? So having more money, because we believe that we can only be the best versions of ourselves creatively when we are in angst, we will then use money to create greater chaos because money can do many things. Money mm -hmm. just expands everything that we already are and what we believe. Because now you've got choice. Now you've got freedom. Now you can create chaos and struggle on a larger scale than yes. before. So actually money can be that thing that can be as a tool that can be used to destroy us. And we've seen mm. it often with artists where it's like someone will be like, yeah, and then we're like, oh, they sold out. And then they get more money. And that money where we're like, oh my God, they were just so chilled and so awesome before they hit their upper limit in terms of how much they can gain deep around money. And those family vows then trigger the opposite. Then you create chaos and use money to destroy you instead of to 
up level you, up level the community mm-hmm. and build yourself. So it is, it's such an important uh, topic to discuss and to also talk about healing. This is why we heal the traumas or else we will, if we come into money without having fully healed our traumas, money, we, we will use money as a weapon against ourselves to destroy ourselves Listen. versus build ourselves. I feel like you're preaching, you're preaching, but you're like, no, not but, and, and unfortunately we're out of time. So this is like the, the, the thing, right? But um, tomorrow we will be having a conversation with Sarah Godsell, um, who's also um, part of Impepo Press. And we're going to be talking about um, the actual production of, um, of, of writing of um, and and the 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 writing kind of um, economy. Well, you know how how to get your books published, how to produce a manuscript, um, the nitty gritties of that. And I see that um, we have a question from um, Jennifer Shiokara. Um, and I would like to encourage Jennifer because she's she's talking about. Um, creating a poetry unit and to ensure that people get interested in poetry. Um, I would like you to please record this, this um, question that you've sent in and um, come back tomorrow and ask it because um, tomorrow we'll be able to, to have a conversation around it. But for now, um, yo, Vangile, thank you so much. Thank you so very, very thank much. Thank you, Like, um, kanye wow. wo. Um, and so that brings us to the end of um, part two of the conversations um, around living as a poet, which have been brought to us by the French Institute of South Africa and Total South Africa, and kindly, kindly, beautifully hosted at this beautiful festival of Poetry Africa, um, organized by the UKZN Center for Creative um, Arts. And, I really would like to um, encourage everyone to please check out the festival, check out the events. Um, There are so many beautiful things happening um, today and for the rest of the week. So um, with peace, with love, thank you. Thank you guys.